So, I am going to talk to you guys about invasive species. But, um, as some of you know, I like to pose questions to my students. So, here I am treating you like students instead of treating myself like the end-all be-all of invasive species knowledge, because guess what? I'm not, but I'll do my best. So, um, Stacy mentioned that there were some hunters out there. Um, have any of you, hunters or non-hunters, um, heard of something else that we call invasive species other than invasive? Anybody willing to take a stab? Yeah. Nuisance? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Nuisance? Anybody else have a good idea of what they might be called? Yes? Pests. Pests. Absolutely. Um, in fact, I took a class in college, and this is one of the things that I was studying in invasive species at the time, but this class really got me interested in um, all the different types of invasive species. And we spent the entire first lecture of this graduate level course talking about all the names that these things get called. Um, and you'll notice pest is up there, nuisance is up there. We also call them introduced, alien, noxious, non-indigenous. All of these things pointing to kind of this same idea of they are here now or somewhere now and they weren't there originally. Okay. Now there is some nuance to how we use these words. Um, invasive, for example, invasive, nuisance, noxious, kind of imply the next step of this. They get there, but then they have to cause a problem. So if something is simply non-native, it doesn't mean they're going to cause big problems. Okay, and there are some um, steps that invasive species have to go through in order to kind of get to that next level of badness, if you will, okay, or level of impact. Um, we define invasive species uh, per an executive order, which means they're here now and they weren't there before. And then this is that next step. They are likely to cause harm to the economy, the ecosystem, or human health. Okay? One or all of those. And one example that I'm going to talk about does all three of those, which makes it particularly nasty. So if we think about what can be invasive, we know that Kind of these big things can be invasive. Fish can be invasive. Plants can be invasive. But also really tiny things without a backbone like invertebrates can be invasive. Um, and then disease or other pathogens like parasites. And one parasite we're going to talk about um, today is one that is present in Wyoming. So we're going to get a little taste of both these terrestrial and so from here on out, if I say terrestrial, that just means on land. Aquatic means in the water. And so all of these various types of invasive species can be found in both of those areas. So you may think to yourselves, in fact, many people think to, think to themselves, well, you know, why, why should I be worried about this? Um, or why should the government take an interest? Why should um, game and fish take an interest. Um, the first one we can put out is human health, right? If these impact, and, it, and it, I realize it's a very human centric thing to think about, but sometimes that's the way we get money, the way we get funding. If it harms human health, then people will fund research to try to figure out what the deal is, okay? Next thing is money, okay? If it's going to cost us money, people all of a sudden start to get worried about it, okay? Um, annual cost of invasive species is somewhere around $138 billion per year to manage these things, okay? So it's not a cheap endeavor. And so something that we can talk about as we go through this is the idea of, and the same thing goes for medical care. The best protection is er 
best protection is early detection. Right? So this whole idea of there are these stages that these organisms have to go through in order to start causing all of these problems. Where in that line should we start the battle, if you will? Okay? And then finally, and you know, from a biological perspective, even though I'm mentioning it last, the most important are our ecological effects. So um, things that invasive species do is they displace native species, things that have evolved there that are kind of meant to be there. Um, they disrupt community interactions, particularly when it comes to um, food chains and food availability, uh, can affect livestock production, okay? And that one kind of funnels into our economic impacts as well. Um, we use the ecosystem for much more than just looking at. A lot of ecosystems, what we call ecosystem services, like nutrient and water cycles, can be um, impacted by these. And then finally, threatened or endangered species. Things that might not have a lot of members of the population left. If you kind of mess with them, then they may not be there anymore. Um, and then the final tidbit of this is why should we concern ourselves? Well, primarily because it's our fault. <laughs> it's our fault. Maybe not you individually, right? You may not have put a non-native species where it didn't belong. But we as a human culture have started doing things like travel. Travel and having preferences for being surrounded by pretty plants and animals. We like these things. Um, this one is a big one, and we'll talk about an example of escaped, and of course, if you're in my biology classes, you know that my laser pointer doesn't work, and I'm just being reminded of this now. Um, escaped ornamentals. So those are things that we like to have on our gardens that may not be from where we live now. Uh, pet and aquaria releases. They're, oh, I remember I have something else to talk about when I get there, so I hope I remember. Um, we get tired of the animals in our fish tanks and we dump them in a stream or a river because we think that's, you know, the nice thing to do. It's not the nice thing to do. Um, movement of soil, particularly in terms of pathogens and disease or microscopic organisms. Um, disposal of solid waste. Um, ballast water and water channels are a big, big, big issue with aquatic invasive species. Okay, we unknowingly, in the course of transporting goods or people, are also bringing along the water that these organisms can live in. Okay, uh, ballast water, and we'll talk about it in a moment, is one of the most, or is the way by which we got one of our most famous American invasive species. Anybody know what I'm talking about? The what? One more time. The eel thing? Not the eel thing, but the zebra mussel. The zebra mussel. Ballast water. Um, vehicular transport, recreation, all of these things. You know, the, on the whole, a large majority of invasive species are invasive species because humans have moved them or made it possible for them to move, right? So why should we concern ourselves? Well, you know, it's our fault. I mentioned these levels of, or steps for things to kind of hit this ultimate level of invasion. The first step is they have to get there, so they have to be introduced. But at each level, there may be species that don't make it to the next steps. So there are species that can be introduced, but they don't become established. 
So some of those species that are introduced become established. Some of those species that become established spread. And then some of those species that spread have an impact. Okay? So I kind of mentioned this before, that idea of early detection, it's a whole lot easier to prevent introduction and establishment than it is to mitigate impacts. Okay? It's way easier. It's way cheaper. Okay? But we don't always know who's going to be introduced and who's going to establish, who's going to spread. Okay? So this is why research in this area that individuals in the biological, ecological fields is really important because we need the information so that we can make informed decisions. So this was me once upon a time. And it's hard to believe that I was in grad school 10 years ago. Um, but that anniversary has come and gone. Um, but I did research on the zebra mussel. And I was kind of where I lived, where I was doing this research in Oklahoma and Kansas reservoirs, was kind of along that western line. 10 years ago, it was along that western line of the zebra mussel distribution. And there was this campaign for these zebra mussels not crossing the 100th meridian. Okay? They have crossed at this point. Um, but at the time, it was kind of new information. And a lot of research had been done on natural lakes, but not in the water of reservoirs. So that's what I got to do, and it was a lot of fun. Um, so a little bit of history into the zebra mussel specifically. Um, they, everything is native somewhere. That's important to remember. Every, everything is native somewhere. Um, these happen to be native to the uh, Black and Caspian Sea areas. And these were introduced to the United States in the mid-1980s in Lake St. Clair is where they first got there. Um, and as I mentioned, that ballast water. So ships making transatlantic journeys take up water, and it helps them float. And then they let go of that water, they take up water, and they go back. Okay. Um, and these zebra mussels, I'm going to come back to this. These zebra mussels have a free-floating juvenile stage. They're called planktonic villagers, which is super fun to say, so that's why I wanted to get here. Planktonic villagers. Um, and then they settle as adults. But even as settled juveniles, they're like one to three millimeters. Okay, so think about how teeny tiny that is. And they're microscopic when they are these villagers. So they didn't know they were there in the water. They didn't know any better. But guess what? Those shipments kept coming over, kept coming over, kept coming over. Um, something called, if you guys are interested in looking at it, it's called propagule pressure, which is another fun phrase to say. But the more often these things were introduced, the more likely they were to become established. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. So let me go back. I want to see whether or not this link still works. And it may not, but we're going to try for it. OK, so if you watch here, this is a time lapse of the spread of zebra mussels. So we're coming up on the time when most of you were born. There you go. So here we are kind of along that 100th meridian. We don't have too many introductions, but it's gotten into waterways that maybe it wouldn't have otherwise. But a big story of how 
one species can spread. So let me go back here. So these guys are filter feeders. When I told people, when I first started this, when I told people I studied zebra mussels, they're like, oh, cool, like zebras, they're mussels. I'm like, no, 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 no. Had to make that correction very, very many times in my life. Um, but these guys, just like a pool filter, filters pool water, they suck in the water, they keep what they want to keep, and they spit the rest back out, okay? And one teeny tiny, like one centimeter long muscle can filter somewhere from one to five liters of water a day. And that's a lot for a little tiny organism, okay? So they eat a lot, and they're really good at it, okay? And that is how they outcompete native mussels. They can be very, very dense. So this is a shopping cart that was pulled out of, I don't know what body of water it was pulled out of, pulled out of, but they form very, very dense mats. And something else cool about them, they have these little threads that have glue, like glue on them, and that's how they attach to these substances, and that's how they attach to one another. And so literally, if you want to pull these things off, you're literally ripping those threads because the glue doesn't release. You like, unfortunately, pull the inside of the zebra mussel out because that's how strong the glue is. The glue stays there. It's ridiculous. Um, so these high densities, one big problem that these high densities cause are with um, water intake pipes. So think about a water treatment facility or an electrical power plant generation. You've got these pipes that become completely blocked with these things. Okay? I'll tell you, bleach kills the suckers. But guess what? Kills everything else in the water too. Okay, so they become really, really hard to chemically remove and really, really hard to physically remove as well. Okay, um, that would be like disassembling all of these pipes and these facilities and it's not monetarily or um, physically possible. It's ridiculous. So I mentioned the pipe fouling. Um, we can also have problems with uh, drinking water. So these guys are also really good at, I mentioned they filter and then they spit stuff back out. So some of the stuff they spit back out are things that they don't want to eat, like particular strains of algae. And these algae happen to be the ones that form algal blooms that can produce toxic chemicals in the water. So if zebra mussels don't want them, nothing wants them, right? So they get kind of this power struggle of algae where the good bacteria, or excuse me, the good algae is all gone, the bad algae is all there, and now there's nothing to compete with the bad algae, okay? Um, from 1989 to 2004, this cost $267 million. It's not cheap to fix these things, fix these problems. Um, because they are such good filter feeders, they cause shifts in native food webs. So they will consume the algae, but now there's no more algae to be eaten by the other native mussels or by other aquatic animals that we call zooplankton. Then you've got little teeny fish that are eating the zooplankton. You've got the big fish that are eating the little fish. Okay? If you disrupt one part of this chain, everything downstream from it, can be altered. Um, we can also alter nutrient cycling. So nitrogen, phosphorus, um, which are really important to have in a particular balance in waterways. Um, these things are so good, again, so good at doing what they do that they cause these problems. Um, I'm going to whiz through my research, mostly just to show you some really cool pictures of things that have been done to study these, um, as I have flashbacks to how difficult these things were to deal with. Um, so this is a picture of a giant plastic bag 
that I had to make float in a reservoir. Giant plastic bag, huge foot diameter corrugated plastic pipe filled with styrofoam. I can't even tell you <laughs> how much looking at that just gives me the, the, the willies. So we put these in reservoirs, and this is one of the reservoirs we put them in. Um, Luckily, we had this nice little docking area to put these guys in. And we filled them up with water from the reservoir. Um, and this was a reservoir that did already have zebra mussels in it. So we were able to harvest the mussels and use them in these, what we called in situ mesocosms. Um, because you can't put zebra mussels in a body of water that doesn't have zebra mussels. Inside a plastic bag or not. Okay, that, that would be a poor choice. Okay, that's called poor scientific ethics. Um, but then I also did a small, oh, let me show you some of the fun pieces of data collecting equipment I got to use. Whoops. I got to measure tur turbidity. I got to collect um, zooplankton samples with this tow net and a super fun integrated depth sampler with a probably 20-year-old boat, which was just even more a pain, of the a pain in the ass than the plastic bags were. Um, let's see, what else did we do? We looked at water from reservoirs, various reservoirs. Um, so we went and did a lab uh, experiment as well. So we were looking at things for nitrogen, phosphorus, turbidity, and just a lot of cool stuff that we had to find out. Still had to light stuff because guess what? I had to keep the algae alive to make sure everything worked the way it was supposed to work. So, anywho, let's get on to maybe some stuff that you're more interested in. Like stuff from Wyoming. Stuff that's newsworthy. Two things that have been found very recently in the Flaming Gorge Reservoir are curly pondweed and the New Zealand mud snail. So those two up there. Um, this has happened within the last year that these guys have been found. Not to say that they haven't been there for longer than that, but someone found them and reported them. Um, as being there. Uh, the other one, and I am remembering this because we are talking about uh, pets. Um, anybody familiar with the dog park here in Rock Springs? Dog park in the pond? Somebody dumped goldfish in the pond, dumped some carp, which are an invasive species, and someone luckily was able to report that to Game and Fish, and they were able to um, remove those goldfish from that body of water. Um, another fun example was within the last year. Did anybody hear about the zebra mussels in the moss balls? Anybody? No? Well, there were zebra mussels found in moss balls purchased from pet stores in Wyoming. And hopefully, I say this very, very hopefully, hopefully, the people that did buy them followed the instructions to get rid of them. Because again, these things don't die very easily. You gotta bleach them or you gotta boil them. Like, those are the rules. <laughs> like, but again, that kills everything else too. So, um, curly pondweed, New Zealand mud snail, goldfish in the dog park pond, and zebra mussels in the moss balls. So, this is why we never, ever, ever, ever dump things from our aquaria in the water. So, I have a couple examples here, and luckily I did have curly pondweed already included in this. Um, but a couple examples of things that have been introduced to Wyoming, okay? So, this curly pondweed introduced in the United States, you know, a long time ago, mid-1800s. 
um, got to or was spread potentially by fish stocking operations. Why do we stock fish? So you can fish, precisely. Sport fishing. Sport fishing. If I, if I was able to give you an extra credit point, I would. Okay, check. Okay. Sport fishing. The problem with these things is that they are so good at reproducing. They form these super dense mats. They can propagate themselves just from a little tiny portion of the leaves. These seeds just, just grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. Um, and these dense mats can, guess what? We want to have recreational activities, but these things can get stuck in boat motors and reduce transportation on recreational waterways. Okay, so not so good. Um, our New Zealand mud snail, native to New Zealand, surprised, um, and it was introduced first in the United States to Idaho in 1987. And both curly, I should say, both curly pondweed and New Zealand mud snails have been in Wyoming waterways, but they haven't been seen in the gorge. Okay, so they didn't just like get here overnight. They've been close. But guess what? These guys don't pay attention to waterways. Like, hey, you stay in Idaho. I'm not going to cross over to Wyoming. Doesn't work that way. Okay. All of these like lines that we draw are completely imaginary to biological organisms. Um, again, ballast water or game fish imports. So again, are you seeing why I said it's all our fault? Because most of the time it's our fault. Um, they displace and complete with native invertebrates, just like our zebra mussels do. Um, so those two, we've got an aquatic plant and aquatic invertebrate example. This is an aquatic, aquatic pathogen called whirling disease. So whirling disease is caused by a parasite, and it gets its name because in the fry, in the little teeny tiny babies of this fish, when they have this parasite, their spine is malformed. And when they try to swim, all they kind of do is swim in little corkscrews. So it affects their survival, affects their reproduction, um, and it kills off the trout and salmon that people want to fish. Okay. And again, it is a pathogen or a parasite that's transmitted from fish to fish. And so we brought it here. Um, terrestrial plant, Russian olives. We thought it was pretty. We brought it in for horticulture purposes. We thought it was nice. Great. But outcompetes native species because it grows so fast and so big. I know of a handful of Russian olives in Rock Springs, and I drive by them all the time, and I shake my head. Same thing I do when I see all the Chinese elms in my neighborhood. European starling. This is one of the funniest reasons for introduction ever. This bird was legitimately introduced to the United States because people wanted to bring all of the birds that were mentioned in the works of William, Sh William Shakespeare to the United States when we colonized the United States. I kid you not, Tasha. I kid you not. That's why it was brought here. And guess what? It does very well at its job, which is finding food and making babies. So much so that many, many native songbirds in the United States were displaced or were forced to go extinct because we wanted these here for Shakespeare. Anyway, I'm not blaming Shakespeare. I'm not. But legitimately, that's why it's here. Um, emerald ash borer, a plant, or excuse me, a terrestrial plant eater, I should say, terrestrial invertebrate. Um, these guys are things that will destroy 
ash plants. Um, they burrow into, and if you've ever seen, um, it's very similar to other beetle kill. If you've ever seen beetle kill pine, um, you can see the little insect tracks that the larva of these things eat through. Um, within two years, these things can lose their whole canopy, so they're all their whole leaves, and then all of their um, functionality within three to four years. And again, by accident. Okay? And this is one of those um, things you may see if you guys are, are campers um, buying firewood from where you're camping or using fallen trees. You don't want to take firewood from one place to another because guess what? You set it on fire, these things start to uh, leave the wood and then they go to wherever they are. Okay? So just a little something to keep in mind. Um, a plant pathogen, white, white pine blister rust. Um, again, all of these things are accidental, but they're all because people are moving or moving things um, on white pine seedlings that were imported from Europe in the early 1900s. So this is where I feel I start to feel kind of guilty as a human being for, you know, not taking care of the environment. But a favorite one that everybody here likes to talk about is the burbot. Um, burbot here in Wyoming is an invasive species um, because it was not originally found here. Um, we have some fun, I say fun, um, I'm sure people who do it have fun, uh, fun ways of dealing with burbot, the burbot bash, where literally your job as a sport fisher person is to pull out as many burbot as humanly possible. Just take them out. Just take them out, take them out, take them out. Okay. Um, some recent recent-ish, I forget the year of publication here, um, a, a recent um, publication on this was done in conjunction with uh, Department of Fish in Colorado in Wyoming Game and Fish um, recently. Just some really good information if that, if that interests you. Um, kind of figuring out where they get from and how they get from point A to point B is, is actually pretty cool. Um, important thing to remember also, things to keep in perspective, um, that is that things that are invasive here aren't invasive everywhere. And in some cases they are endangered in other water bodies. Okay, burbot, for example, are native in areas of, and I might misspeak, but uh, Michigan, Wisconsin area. And they are endangered there. Their numbers are very, very low. And here we are in Flaming Gorge just like chucking them on, <laughs> chucking them on the side of the road because they're causing issues with our native fish and with our sports fish. But that is technically neither here nor there. Just food for thought. So kind of to wrap up, thinking about what this means, and again, coming, coming again to the um, human side of this, is that we've altered travel and transport mechanisms. By having transatlantic shipping, we do this. These new invasives have become established and a lot of a lot of people ask the question and it's you know it's a perfectly legitimate question and I don't know that I have an answer to it but well they've been here for so long so why don't we just let them stay right so how how long do we go trying to fight this thing instead of accepting the inevitable I don't know what the answer to that question is But also, 
altered effectiveness of control strategies. Um, another story, and I forgot to tell this story earlier, but it's a great story. Um, have you guys ever heard of in, I think they're a big problem in Texas, but the cane toad? Anybody? Um, so cane toads were originally thought to be this really great biological control mechanism. They would eat all of these pests. So the genius idea was, let's get all of these cane toads in here to our sugar cane fields, and then they're going to take care of all the pests. Well, it didn't work. And then they moved from point A to point B and started eating everything else. Okay, so all of these things, all of this ultimately stems from, from global change. And what should we do about it? You know, awareness is the first step. So thank you for coming here and learning about invasive species today. Um, if this is a topic that interests you, reach out to Stacy, or and she can put you in contact with me or just reach out to me. Um, I love to talk about this stuff, so um, I'm always willing to chat about invasive species because I think it's really, really cool. Um, so with that, I will give you your code, and then I'll take questions, and I'll try to repeat the question. <laughs> Thank you, Stacy. Come on, I gotta have at least one. Give me three questions. Yes, ma'am. How do they deal with the zebra mussels in the pipes? They go and mechanically remove them, like physically. Because they can't, there, I have seen some research, but I'm not super up to date on it. I have seen some research of using chemicals that are like in a little sphere type thing so that they're only targeting the zebra mussel. I don't know if that's well used, but physical removal of those. Okay, that's one. I need two more. What are some native trees to like Southwest Wyoming? Native trees to Southwest Wyoming. Um, define Southwest Wyoming. Um, let's see, willows, cottonwoods. Those are the two that I can think of off the top of my head. Willows, cottonwoods. I am not native to Wyoming, so. How about the pinyon pines? Pinyon pines. Sagebrush. Sagebrush. Aspens. Aspens. Yes, Tasha. <laughs> I love that question, and I'm going to repeat it. And I really hate that this is being recorded. But Tasha just asked, in my opinion, what is the uh, the most detrimental invasive species? We are humans. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Emma. Um, do you know what you can recommend to receiving the zebra mussels and checking their native environment? Yes. Um, Emma asked if there was an ecological factor that was keeping them in check in their native areas. Yes, ducks and fish and things would eat those. Here, we don't have anything that eats them. To my knowledge, and this was, this was being researched when I was in school, as, in school as well, that they had found like a bluegill catfish that had a zebra mussel in its digestive tract, but it was like one, and so not meaningfully reduced here. Would it would it be beneficial to introduce those same things here? Um, I think we run the risk of having the same problems as we had like with that cane toad. Anytime we do a biological control mechanism, we have to be prepared for that not to work because we don't know what's going to happen with those ducks and the native ducks and the native fish. And it's, this whole thing is very, very inter, interwoven and it's hard to predict what changes might happen. We no, we'll never know. Anything else? Yes, Emma. Um, 
What are your thoughts on the ecological impacts of pet cats? What are my thoughts on the ecological impacts of pet cats? Um, pet cats, pet cats that are inside pets, not so big of a deal. Feral cats have a very, very high impact on native songbird, reptile, and um, rodent populations. I mean, we might think of rodent control as a good thing, but not necessarily because rodents eat the insects and the, all of the stuff is so complex. So I guess it depends on where you keep your cat, inside or outside. Um, but yeah, the feral populations become an issue with, with those things that they can eat, <laughs> right? I got more than three questions. I'm very happy. I'm done.